Hi there, my name is Logan Lachane. I'm a fantasy author of Into Ebonmore, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented uh, author. She has created an amazing book called Into the Even More. I'm sure I mispronounced it, but I'll let her actually tell, tell, tell us what it's all about. We're joined today by the ever-talented Logan Lashane. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. I love fantasy authors because fantasy has been kind of my jam for, for a number of years. I grew up with the Dragonlance series. I drew, grew up with Phasmoth and all this other stuff. So uh, to to see a, a, a fresh take on on fantasy as you're doing it is is amazing. And I'm loving what I've read so far. And as I said previously, I want to read the rest of the book. So thank you for turning me on to your series. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, awesome. I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> for those that don't know anything about your series. Tell us what it's all about. So Into Ebonmore is a, a fantasy series. Um, I basically came up with the concept probably 20 years ago, and it's sort of been rolling around in my head ever since. Um, and it basically just combines the two things that I am most passionate about, which is fantasy writing and also mental health issues. So I try to have characters that are quite flawed. They may have some mental health issues themselves, but kind of I'm trying to highlight that that doesn't make it a shortcoming. That kind of can almost make it a strength. So that's sort of sort of the, the basic genre uh, that I've been working on. You touch on, on anxiety. You touch on depression. You touch on loss. I mean, you're hitting some pretty major aspects of, of being a human being in general, uh, especially those dealing with the various flaws that they're dealing with. Uh, and that was just in the first, you know, 100 pages or 50 pages or so. So why is it that your characters needed to be flawed as they are? I think it was sort of just something that I feel so deeply about. I worked in the the health field for about six years. And so I, and particularly in the mental health field. So I saw a lot of patients who had things like anxiety and depression and PTSD and, and things like that. And, and then I have some of my own, you know, I'm very introverted. I'm anxious. I'm, I'm very shy by nature. Um, and I have PTSD myself from a motor vehicle accident that I was in, in 2009. Something for myself when I, was sort of starting to come up with this concept is using the idea of dissociation. That was sort of the thing that I really centered on. And it was because not a lot of people have heard of that, but a lot of people have that. And I thought that was a really interesting thing. I myself didn't know that there was a name to, to put to it. Basics of dissociation is it's essentially getting stuck in your own head. So it's almost like you're watching the world on a television set because you can't connect with it. So you can see it, you can hear, but you can't really feel it and you can't experience it. And anyone that has trauma in their life, anyone that has PTSD, they probably have this. So that I kind of wanted to sort of meld that because I loved the fantasy world and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to sort of try and blend those two things? So what I wanted to do is I created this character who has dissociation from a traumatic past and so the world that he lives in already, he feels very detached from it. And so I just thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we create another world that he can enter from that point? Because it feels as unreal as the real world does. And so I really wanted to just kind of play around with that idea. You touch upon it at the very beginning of the book and you touch upon it during the, the transition aspect where I'm currently at in the book itself. And it's not like your typical Harry Potter where everything's, you know, sunshine, roses, and all that other stuff. There's actual struggle, not only in the world he goes to, but in in his his own internal communication and, and conflict. I love the fact that you're u utilizing your characters to its their full potential. Uh, and I, I definitely want to see how they're going to deal with themselves in the future as well. So I, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really wanted to try something like this because I think the world is ready for it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I think um, people are so much more willing to talk about such things as mental health issues now, whereas before there was a lot more of a stigma attached to it. 
Um, so I kind of felt like this is not your typical fantasy. Usually fantasy is very, you know, magical and, and, you know, all these really cool elements in it that we kind of read as a form of escape. I wanted to create a world that you're almost not escaping, you're almost becoming a part of it. We all deal with our own trauma in our own ways, whether it's by seeking help or whether we are, we're able to internally resolve it or if we're able to just simply talk it out mm -hmm. through basic communication is always a, a wonderful way to to approach whatever uh, we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some have to deal with it more than others. But as an author, though, you you know, you're, you're taking a... A person with trauma, you're, you're bringing them into this world. Um, you know, how did you create this particular character though? Was it, was it bits of yourself or was it from other people that you observed or was it kind of a combination? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I think the, the main character of the story, Jordy, he is very much modeled after myself. I mean, there's, there's definitely differences. I think he's a bit cooler than I am, but he, he, he's definitely modeled after myself because especially initially, He's quite timid and reserved. He's a people pleaser. He kind of just follows along with whatever people are telling him to do because he doesn't really have the, the confidence to be himself. And then on top of that, he also has a, a highly sensitive trait as well, which is something that I have. I only just found out about this, but there's, um, the, the science behind it is really interesting. But yeah, there's about 20% of the population that have this highly sensitive trait. And so, you know, the people that are like, I, I know that that was going to happen before it happened. They tend mm -hmm. to be the ones that they're picking up on all those tiny little things in life that a lot of people miss. And so I wanted to create a character that had that, but kind of times 10. Like he, he has it, he, he's really in tune with the world around him and he can tell when people are telling the truth and he can tell when someone's being deceptive and, and things like that. Like I kind of took something that a lot of people already have, but kind of magnified it a bit. So I just felt like that kind of worked for his character. So then in terms of creating this particular world that, that Jordy has gone to then, you know, what did you use to create that then? Okay, so that that's a good question. The actual truthful basis for this world, it actually started when I was quite young. And I'm really, really bad at things like geography. So I wanted to create a world that no one could come to me and be like, that's not where that is, or it doesn't take that long to travel to that place. So like when I was in my teens, I created this world basically as the lazy out to keep myself from, from doing actual research. But it ended up becoming something so much more than that. And I kept building on this world to the point where at, at one time, my brother and I actually took all these different little books that I had written and we mapped it out and it actually worked. You know, nothing was on top of where something else should have been and that kind of thing. And we, we made this big map and then we kind of realized like, wow, we've, we've created a whole world here. Like there, there's a lot going on and there's all these different places and they're so detailed. Unfortunately, I, I no longer have any of that. I don't have the map. I don't have any of the books that I wrote when I was in my teens. Uh, so it was all completely a uh, clean slate when it came to starting this story, but I still had the world in my head, so it was easy to describe. Your character descriptions, your your descriptions of the world around you is a great benchmark of being a wonderful writer, because if you can describe the world around you, that's not, you know, Tolkien-esque wordy or, you know, too simple that you just kind of gloss over it right uh, you've done you've done a wonderful job with that thank you you know you're, you, it seems like your observation skills are obviously fine-tuned to the point that you you see these little bits as you previously said what are some things that you notice throughout your 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 day-to-day -day life that triggers possible new stories for yourself yeah i'm very emotionally based well, kind of like you said like i am very observant so i love the small things in life <laughs> you know big things are good too but the small things are kind of what makes every day special it can be something as simple as walking into my backyard and just seeing that a new flower has bloomed you know it's a little bit cliche but it, something like that is is usually very stimulating for me. And then probably the number one thing for me is music. By listening to different music, say I kind of have a scene in mind that needs to be intense or an action scene. I tend to listen to maybe soundtracks from video games or, or that kind of thing to kind of stimulate that part of me. 
And then I find I can kind of get that tone, get the feeling of it kind of embedded into the words. With the variety of characters that you've written now, just so I'm clear, this is the first book of your series, yes. correct? And you have a, a few others in the works? Yes. Or working yeah. So I actually have completed the second book and it is available now. And I'm currently writing the third. I'm a little unclear as to how many there's going to be. My original thought was there was going to be three of them. That's definitely not going to be the case. It's it's gotten a lot bigger as I've started writing it. So I'm thinking there's going to be four or five, and that's for the, the first one. So there's going to be a three sets, essentially. Oh. So we're going to have Into Ebonmore is the first one, uh, Return to Ebonmore, and then Finding Ebonmore is kind of the... And, and that will complete the the story that I've been telling. <laughs> So you have a, a bit of work cut out for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what excites you about this particular world as you're, as you're writing it and as you're creating it? For me, mostly it's the characters. I absolutely oh. love all these different characters. Some of them I relate to really well. Some of them I don't relate to at all. And some of them I just want to be them because they're just so cool. So for me, I love, I have the world, I have the characters. And one of my favorite things to do is just no, here's point A, here's point B. This is where I need them to get to. But everything in between, I don't necessarily have a super solid plan for that. So I stick the characters there in this particular setting and I kind of just move it forward from there. And that's one of my favorite ways to write. I find it comes out the best when I kind of leave myself that, that creative space to show the characters off to their best advantage and, and how they would react to certain things or what they can and cannot do. And I just, to me, I love adding those layers upon layers when it comes to these characters, because I want them to have depth. I don't want them to be these super basic, like, oh, we have a princess and she's waiting to be rescued in a tower. And oh, we have this super cool soldier guy. Like, it was like, yes, yes, we have those. But then I want to completely turn it upside down and have you learn so much more about these characters and you realize that, yeah, that's, you're, you've just hit the surface. Like there is a lot more going on. Personally, they have a lot more going on in their background, their past. And it helps me to sort of know that going into it because then I can write it in such a way that even though the reader doesn't know about those things yet, you can kind of look back on what you've already read and start to go, I see why they did that. I, I understand now why they reacted that way and that kind of thing. Like I'm trying to make them as real as possible. Do you find it easier to write as you go or do you find it like, are you hitting roadblocks along the way with either certain characters or maybe is it in your head? So book two, I wrote that in four weeks and I had oh. no issues. It just flowed out of me. Book one was a completely different story. And I'm glad that people are enjoying it. I've gotten some really good feedback, which is so nice to hear. But to me, I felt like it was a bit disjointed. Like I struggled to sort of stitch all of these ideas that I had together because it's such a huge story in my head that it was really hard to go, okay, let's start here and just move from there. Because my story doesn't really have a beginning. Jordy almost gets dropped into this city where we're already right in the middle of something. So to sort of do that and, and keep everything together in my head and be like, okay, is it time to reveal this or should we leave it a little longer? That's sort of been a, a struggle for me. I got better at it in book two. Book three is being a little sticky on me, like I'm, I'm struggling a bit more with book three, but I, I think that's part of the process as well. Like I'm, I'm very new at, at all of this. So I think I'm going to have to kind of feel my way a little bit as I go. What are some issues that you have picked up on being a new author that maybe no one has told you about? I think I went in very much with these rose colored glasses <laughs> and kind of was like, if I put it out there, people are going to read it and they're either going to like it or they're not going to like it. And I'm okay with that. What I didn't realize is I am a drop in a bucket full of water. There is so much content out there and some of it's good and some of it's not so good, but it's so hard to kind of advertise. I mean, I've never shared my work before. It was always just something that I did for me. I kind of thought, you know, yes, I'm ready. This is my time and all this. And then you put it out there and my mom bought one. That was fun. <laughs> um, but, and a few yeah. friends found out. But that's when I started to realize how difficult this process was going to be. 
But what I also found that was really encouraging was the online social community is actually really supportive. And there has been so many people that have reached out to me and given me advice or encouragement. That has just been such a lifeline for me because I really had no idea what I was doing. And I still don't think I know what I'm doing. I'm still very much very green and probably still a little more hopeful than I should be. I mean, you got to hope. Of course. Uh, but social media is always the best way to, to go about promoting yourself. As, as much as you feel like you're, you're badgering the people, <laughs> yeah. especially when you're trying to promote, say, past interviews like I've had to do yep. for the past few weeks, it's, it feels like, am I, am I just pissing people off? Yeah. Or am I actually reaching the audience I want to reach? Exactly. Hey, I got some awesome stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what it feels like is, you know, you almost feel like you're you're badgering the few people that that actually did find you and like you, and then you kind of are like, okay, I, I gotta like leave them alone a little bit. <laughs> like I'm I'm a very fast reader, so I have given my book to a few different ones, and I'll wait like five days, and I'm just like, okay, you know what? It's been five days. It's like now they're just not talking to me. Obviously, they didn't like it. I'm the worst. I'm terrible. And my husband will always kind of back me down and be like, you know. I know this is crazy, but they also have a life and maybe they have not read it yet. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess that's possible. It's, it's, you know, so for me, it's just trying to temper my expectations, but also not become jaded too soon. I'm just trying to go along with this whole thing right now. It's very different from what I expected. And even for me emotionally, I didn't know how I was going to feel when all of this started. I have, I have really good days where I feel really, really good. And other days where I'm kind of like, why did I do this? Why did I put this out there? And, you know, one of the scariest things I think for me writing fantasy is this idea of now everyone knows what the inside of my head looks like. And that's terrifying. <laughs> There's people that are going to read this and just be like, okay, this, this person needs a little more therapy in their life. It's just, it's what I'm passionate about. I definitely feel like I have a, a clear message, a clear story that I want to tell. And I just have this burning drive inside that I really just want to put this out there. So that's why I keep at it. You need persistence, especially when a, when you feel that this, I'm not going to say that this is a hobby, but the fact that you're doing this as a, an outlet, mm -hmm. a creative outlet, as a, as a way to clear some things up uh, going on upstairs yeah. just to make sh make sense of the world around you and to showcase that you do have another talent other than what you do in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the fact that you're, you're able to do this, it doesn't matter what people think. The fact that you've created something and you're one out of seven billion people that are creative or could be creative. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that you're showcasing your work, the fact that Yes, you maybe you feel small at this particular point, but you know, person next door to you probably thought they had a dream of doing something and they just never acted on it. You're acting on it right. and this yeah. is the result. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I'm still trying to kind of recapture certain feelings. I've been writing as long as as long as I found out that these, you know, letters became words and then words could be sentences. I've been writing. When I was a teen, I used to write stories and they were not particularly good. I, they were just stories, but I had like this tiny group of friends that were absolutely obsessed with them. And so every time we would get together, I would have, you know, my stack of loose leaf papers with, you know, my pen ink all over it. And I would read them out loud to this little group and they would just get so into it and so excited or so upset if I killed off their favorite character or, you know, all these things. And I just lived for that. Like I loved that part of, of sharing something that I love so much and seeing other people love it that much too. So when I started on, on this process, I think for me, the most exciting thing was having people reach out and be that excited again. And I'm kind of realizing that was, that's kind of my success. Like to me, that's, that's what I was wanting and that's what I've been getting. And it's kind of like everything after that is, is kind of gravy because it really is just that act of sharing something that I love and having other people love it too. What an incredible right. feeling. What has been the, the reaction of, of the reader base, those that actually read it within the five-day window? That they <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's been very positive. Um, one of the earlier, so when I first wrote it, 
I decided I should get maybe some some test readers before I put it out there for the world. Give it to four people, three people read it. Those three people were so enthusiastic about it and and they gave me such good feedback and i have to give a shout out to one of my friends in particular who read it and was like i loved this and then you wrecked the ending like why did you do that we kind of talked back and forth a little bit and it was kind of like it was such a cool story it was so exciting and then the ending was like eh. and i was kind of like well that's because there's another book and blah 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 but I kind of took it back to the drawing board at that point and I looked at it and I thought, you know what, that is a really disappointing ending. Like, I'm not sure I'd reach for book two based on this ending. Mm. So I completely changed it. It got a, a brand new ending. It worked and people got excited by that. So I kind of thought, yeah, it has to be a little give and take. You do want to write your story and you do want to stick to your concept. But at the same time, feedback is never a bad thing. Sometimes people are going to pick up on things that I might have missed. So that's sort of been a fun process too, is sharing it kind of in the early days and then having people either say, yes, I loved this or or no, I didn't. And another thing that I thought was really, really interesting is I've had a few different people come to me and talk about the control room, which is the, the mm-hmm. first two chapters or chapter and a half of book one is talking about this control room. What was really, really interesting is I've had two people come to me and say, I never knew that I had dissociation, but that spoke to me so much. They're like, that was exactly what I've experienced. And that was really cool to kind of just take what I personally experienced dissociating putting it into some weird fantasy world and having people actually grab that and and say, I I knew exactly what you were talking about because I've been there. I've been sitting there. And I just thought, now that's that's really cool. Like now we're kind of ticking all the boxes when it comes to creating. I just, yeah, that was one of my favorite um, things that I was getting in the way of feedback is just how people were reacting to, to that kind of thing, not even so much the fantasy, but almost more the mental health. Um, there's another part where someone has a, a therapy dog and someone mm-hmm. reached out to me and, and they said, like, I love that you included that. You know, it was such a small thing, but you just, you, you normalized it. Now it's just part of this, this story. And that character was supposed to be a very short term character, but everyone loved him so much that I had to basically give him his own part. And he is pretty cool. I'm, I'm going to keep yeah. him. That kind of thing has been so, so nice for me to experience is sharing it and getting that kind of feedback. Let me dive into this here. Obviously, it sounds like you're an avid reader. Reading is always a very good thing. And, and people sometimes gravitated either in their teens or later on in their life. Yeah. But we all pick up, up upon it early on what's your most recent other than your own work what's your most recent literary pilgrimage that you've gone on the last book i read that was sort of a a science fiction book was uh, project hail mary by andy weir i loved it it was so good and it kind of gave me some inspiration for myself which i think is the the mark of a really good book is when you want to take something from it this story was told where it was it was intense and there was parts that were really scary and yet He's dropping jokes right into the middle of it. And I just love that style. Like to me, if you can get a bit of humor in there in some of these most scary, intense scenes, then that's a win for me. So I absolutely love that book. I was obsessed with it. I kind of like tried to stalk him a little bit, but it didn't really go anywhere. You never know, though. You never know. But maybe one day (laughs) I'll get to talk to anywhere and be like, I think you're cool. In terms of authors that you've read, it doesn't have to be a recent, could have been in, in the past as your teen, uh, as your teenage self, I should say. Uh, was there any authors that you, you first picked up that you just couldn't get into and then later on you, you picked them up again and you're like, this person's... Oh, that's a good question. Ah, let me think. It's rare for me not to get sucked into a book. I think, I think I've put books down if they are just too wordy for me and I just, it, I'm actually struggling to picture it because there's too much going on. But it's pretty rare for me to read a book the first time and just not like it and then pick it up later and really like it. I've almost had the reverse of that happen before so where I've read a book and, and just really, really liked it and then gone back to it later and been like, oh, this, this isn't what I remember, <laughs> which is awful. But 
I, I have this kind of thing that I'll do when I'm reading is I tend to pick up and I do it with my own work too. I do this a lot is I'll read something and I'll notice that the author keeps using a particular expression or saying or that kind of thing. And then once I see it, I cannot unsee it. I did the exact same thing for my own book in book two. I chose this awful word, like just, and now I'm just so triggered because every time I see it, I'm just like, why, why did I like, why that word? Why of all the words did I choose that one and then use it over and over and over in my book? To me, it's, it's like, try to keep it immersive. Try not to do that to your reader. So I'd say that's probably the one thing that I'll notice when I'm reading other people's work is if they have kind of a, a thing that they will do repeatedly, I tend to notice that pretty quickly. What was the word that you... Oh, uh, man. You... Um, <laughs> beefy. <laughs> yep, it was beefy. Okay. I talked about... So anytime I'm referring to kind of like a big, husky, you know, scary yeah. looking guy, I kept saying like his beefy hands. And, you know, you can maybe get away with doing that like one time. I think I counted it eight times. <laughs> and then... Thankfully, we had not actually printed the book yet. So I contacted my editor and I was like, I've caught this thing and I hate it so much. Like, I will never be able to live with myself if we go through with this. So I got to change it. I got to actually go through and change it. But just going through and seeing that word over and over, I'm like, I will never use that word again. Don't know why I used it in the first place, but I'm definitely never using it again. You hit upon an interesting point. Editing a book, obviously, is a very difficult task, especially as, as a creative person. You want to keep almost everything that you've written, yes. minus, minus the beefy aspect. Yes. What, what did you uh, edit out of the book? What did I edit out of the book? I was really, really overly descriptive. The first maybe four chapters, a lot got cut from that because I just started realizing that it was too much detail and we just didn't need it. It didn't really move the story forward anymore. And it kind of felt like it was bogging it down. I really wanted to get into Ebonmore as fast as possible. I didn't want to spend a ton of time in our world because we know what it's like in our world. We don't want to be here. We want to be there. It's a fantasy book. But I still had to set the scene. There still had to be a foundation laid. So initially, I just put way too much in. I got into, you know, his father and what he did for work and his mom and her schedule. And then I just realized we don't need any of this. It's, it's not relevant. I can bring it back in later if I feel the need to. Asking myself those questions, like, it, does this need to be here? Because if it doesn't, just take it out. It's just too wordy. It's, it's bogging the story down. What does literary success look like to you? It's a good question. And in the short time that I've been doing this process, the answer has already changed. Initially, I wanted this to be my job. So initially, the idea was, I'm going to put this out there. It doesn't even need to be a lot of sales. I think I remember saying to my editor, you know, 500 books, that's all I need. Like, I don't care if it's more than that. And he was really nice about it. Like, he did not um, tell me the truth that I would not be selling 500 books. That is not going to happen. Definitely. There was like that letdown initially when it was like, well, only my mom and like a few other people have bought my book. Like, why doesn't everyone love my book? And so then I sort of went through that period of like, wow, this is going to be hard. And then I realized kind of how unlikely it was going to be. And I kind of almost was like, well, then I don't want to do this at all. Like, let's just, let's just stop because it feels, I feel foolish now. And then throughout working on book two, I enjoyed it so much that I realized it really is just about creating. I mean, that's, that's what has always given me joy. That's why I've been writing my whole life is I love to write. I love to make up stories. I love to create different scenarios and make them colorful. So at the end of book two, I was kind of like, you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't matter actually. Just the fact that I'm creating this and it makes it into a book form. You know, it's not just in a binder in a closet anymore. It's actually in a book and that's so cool. And now I've kind of found it changed again. A few people have reached out to me that have read it and they are so enthusiastic about it. And they've got all these questions and they've got all these ideas of where I might be going and whether it's real or whether it's all in his head. And it's been so much fun to engage with people 
that I'm kind of realizing that to me is literary success is just having that interaction with people that are so passionate about it. I can't even tell you what that's done for me. Like it's just made me feel so good. And it just makes me feel like continuing on and writing more stories. And I hope people continue to like them because it's just been such a good time. Basically what I'm trying for is, you know, the fact that you're getting people approaching you via social media, et cetera, telling you about their experiences or maybe via email or however they're interacting with you. Um, the fact that they're saying your book has, uh, has helped them with, you know, normalizing their, their trauma and, right. and their yeah. um, uh, abilities, et cetera. Um, you know, does that give you incentive to keep writing is what I was going for, where you kind of answer that question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, absolutely. And there's, there's actually going to be more, uh, I have no intention of stopping. You know, there are so many different forms of mental health issues and I have enough experience about it because that's my one thing is it does have to feel authentic. I'm not writing it to offend people. I'm not writing it to, as shock value. It's, it's not meant to be there simply for the sake of being different. It's like, no, this is, this is important to me and I feel like it's important to a lot of people. And so to me, it just makes it so much more people can connect on, on such a good level. I feel like there's almost a character for everyone because we have so many different personality styles and personality types and different coping mechanisms and, and how people deal and how some people maybe don't deal with it so well. To me, it's all about starting a conversation and showing people that they are not alone and that, you know, even if you end up with a diagnosis, even a serious diagnosis, that does not mean that that's who you are. That's not your defining thing. It's not like, hello, my name is, and this is what I have. It's just something you have. And, and so I wanted to create these characters that, yeah, they've got, they've got the, some of them have really serious mental health issues and trauma in their past, but that's not necessarily, you're not going to find that out right away. You kind of get to know the person first and then it kind of almost comes out later, later in kind of an organic way. And to me, that's actually pretty natural. I think that's how the world actually does work. It's very rare that you're going to meet someone for the first time, you know, at a grocery store or something and have them just dump everything on you. I mean, some people will do that, but for the most part, we tend to get to know someone first and like them and talk with them. And then you start to get this information about them that just changes how you feel about them and you can have that deeper connection with them. That's what I wanted to create in, in my books as well and, and start that dialogue. One of the things that we have in my books is there's actually, you know, codes and different, you know, secret messages and stuff right in the book for readers to find if they want to, right? So there almost is an element because basically when I was writing this, I just wrote about anything that I thought was cool, you know, just stuff that I personally enjoy. And it's like, if I was reading a book, this is what I would want to have in it. So I'm going to put it in there for the few people that are like me that would like that too. It's good to have Easter eggs like that because it, it allows you to go back to back through a book and through a series that you enjoy. Right. And, yeah. And yeah. There are, there are comics out there that have done the exact same thing. Uh, most famously is xkcd.com, I believe. And every comic that they post in, there's thousands literally uh, over the past decade or so. But if you hover over the image, there's an alt tag, which has secondary storyline information of that particular comic. Oh, I love that. So if you look at it at face value, you get a great comic. But if you dive into it even deeper, you you have a secondary storyline with that comic. Yeah, that's, that's so perfect. cool. And that's kind of what I wanted to do with my book is like, yeah, it's, it's a fun book. Like, I hope you enjoy reading it. But for the people that read it and kind of want that extra element, it's kind of a fun way to do that, you know, and it does make you be more observant. And I, I really wanted it to sort of make the reader feel like they were actually part of the story. So uh, without giving away any spoilers, there's a, there is a point in the book where Jordy solves this cipher and he walks, you know, his friends through how to solve this. And then that's literally explaining to the reader how to solve the code that's then in the book for them. And it takes it to the website as well. So it actually... You have to input a code on the website, and then from there you get extra content that takes you back to the books. It just was kind of something that I thought would be really cool and would sort of help the reader. If they were interested, it would help them kind of feel like they have 
a bit of a leg up on other readers that maybe didn't take the time to do that and kind of are like, oh, I think I know where this is going because I have this extra bit of information. So I don't know. I haven't had a lot of feedback yet at this point, but like I said, I thought it was cool. So we decided to try it out. Why not? I mean, especially if you have that type of theme and, and the general theme that you're going for through your characters, obviously, are, are, it's well thought out year. You're doing a great service to those that are are going to enjoy this series and this book. Thank and the you. Fact that you're, you're taking the time to flesh out your characters. And in fact, the one thing that kind of crossed my mind, which was interesting, was you could turn this into like a D&D campaign, truly. like It, d- it does have a bit of a feel, right? And And again, with that feeling of I wanted to insert the reader right into the story. So there are elements of it where it it almost is immersion breaking because you see something that doesn't really fit and you're kind of wondering why it's in there. And it it does kind of come along later, but it's, it's there for the reader. It's there for the reader to feel like they are going along on this adventure. They're actually a part of it. Is there anything that I haven't touched upon that uh, you'd like those to know and I guess maybe one thing that I would like to mention, and I think it might be a little bit different from what people are used to, is while it is a a fantasy book, it actually doesn't have a magic system in it. And I did that because I always, just personally, always found magic just felt like kind of the lazy way out. And I always wanted to have sort of this weirdly scientific reason for something to happen, right? So Mm -hmm. in my books, um, I kind of refer to them more as a science fantasy book as opposed to just a straight fantasy book because it does have that aspect to it where it's, it's a science based system. There's, there's bikes that hover, but it's because of magnets and, you know, there's this whole, you know, obviously it wouldn't work in our world, but that's fine because we're not in our world. We're in Ebonmore. So just, I, I think that would be a little bit of a different element for some readers is maybe they're expecting that and mine doesn't have any. So maybe that would just be something sort of a heads up to people. If if they're looking for that, my book won't have that in it. It feels like a, a kind of a steampunk-esque, not saying it's it's along that line, but it, it has that, that feel. I love it, that. So. Thank you. I actually think that's super cool. To me, it kind of it's drawing upon uh, an old arc, an old video game I used to play called Arcanum, which had steampunk elements mixed with high fantasy. So, uh, really old game, but it was a really fun, like top-down RPG. Anyhow, so it, I, I'm feeling, even though I know it's no correlation whatsoever with Into Even More, uh, I am having that feel whenever I'm reading into these characters and into the 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 societies that you're building. Right. So I think yeah. it's really interesting. I think it, it does have a bit of an old school feel. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that actually has a lot to do with the fact that all the fantasy that I used to read is from like, the eighties and the nineties. Like it's, it's really old stuff. And then I kind of moved on from that. Like I always enjoyed writing it, but I kind of stopped reading fantasy for a long time. And then I wrote this one and I started to try to find kind of the, the sub genre that, it fit into. And that's when I realized there is this world of fantasy that I knew nothing about. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, am I going to be at a big disadvantage? Like this is, this is not what people are reading right now. This is kind of your, your old stuff. And you know, it's, it's almost got like that Lord of the Rings feel to it where they're going on this, you know, fellowship adventure type thing. And that's not really being done anymore. So I was kind of wondering if I'd sort of I, I kind of fell behind the times, but the response I'm getting isn't that. Most people that are reading reading it like that, it has that old school feel. It's kind of like it's recapturing something that they remember with fondness, you know, from a long time ago. Well, now I have to ask, what did you read in the 80s and 90s? <laughs> so my absolute favorite was Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks. That definitely mm-hmm. was the book that started it all. My dad uh, let me read his copy when I was eight, which is probably not appropriate, but I loved it. I was so hooked at that point. So I basically just started eating up all of his stuff. I loved Terry Brooks. I loved his style. And so there was like a few like that. And then also there was things like the Wizard of Oz, strangely. I mean, I'm still a huge fan of Wizard of Oz because I love the world he created and the characters he created. So, you know, things like that, you know, Alice in Wonderland and and that kind of thing, just 
almost weird, right? Like almost gives you a little bit of a creepy feeling when you're in it. And I wanted to create a world that had the same thing, you know, just weird and creepy and uncomfortable, but also you want to be there because it's really interesting and different and familiar at the same time. You don't, you're right. You don't see those types of books these days anymore. And that's like 40 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It goes goes back pretty far now. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, uh, wow, I can't believe I've been reading it for that long. It's crazy. Uh, Don't look weirdly at me. So yeah, I basically took a break, right? Like that's all the stuff I read. And then I just kind of stopped reading that genre. So I was still heavily influenced when I was coming up with the concept because that's Mm -hmm. what I knew. And so then when I kind of started looking into self-publishing it was like uh-oh i don't even know where to put this i don't know how to class it like i just i don't even know what to describe this so the best i could do was to come up with i think amazon it doesn't give you a lot of options so i put it under dark fantasy i don't know if it qualifies as a dark fantasy to me it doesn't i mean there's dark elements to it i don't know that it's dark fantasy but it didn't fit in epic fantasy because epic fantasy always has magic in it so i was like okay so it's not that it's not urban I mean, it's in a city, but it's just, it's not urban. So I went with dark. That was kind of the closest thing I could come to. But I think if they ever made a little bit more of a comprehensive list, I'd probably refer to it more as a science fantasy or perhaps a portal fantasy where we start in one world and end up in another. Yeah. I mean, you could always go sci-fi technically. I mean, you have elements of it in there too. You Maybe it's not to the point of, of blasters and all it's true stuff. yeah i might make some people really mad like people that are really into science fiction might be like this is not science fiction i don't know hey <laughs> comments are always welcome that means they're looking at this it, is so true this is true <laughs> Um, I'm going to dive a little more introspective here now. I've had a wonderful time talking with you, and I know we're we're limited on time overall, so I do appreciate it. Uh, at what point are we good enough? It's a good question. I know for myself, I will never be good enough. I'm a perfectionist by nature in everything that I do in life, but I never do anything perfectly. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm my own monster that way. Um, but I definitely do have successes. I have days that I just feel really good about what I've done. You know, maybe it's not perfect, but I've still managed to make a connection or someone has reached out to me and said, this really, this, this hit me and this, this, I really liked this. That's definitely uh, a success. As for being good enough, yeah, I, I think I think I'm always going to be on a, a journey. I'm always going to be seeking perfection that I'm never going to get. So the best thing that I can probably do is just try and enjoy the the small moments here and there, the the, the small successes every day. What is one mistake that you will never ever do again? Hmm. There's a lot of mistakes, but I'll probably keep making them. That's the problem with me is I don't really learn from my mistakes. <laughs> so um, I guess probably the best example would be when I initially um, started up the website, I initially didn't show my face. I, I just, I wanted to kind of, to me, it was like it would be mysterious and it would add to the the coolness of this story. And then pretty quickly, I realized that the way the world is now, they actually do want to see your face. I mean, they they want to engage with you. So I'd say that was a mistake that I made initially was just trying to uh, put a, a distance between myself and, and the readers, um, because I kind of thought it would be this really cool added element. And it wasn't actually, it just prevented me from having more meaningful discussions with people sooner. What is the wisest thing someone has ever said to you that stuck with you in your life? Just do what makes you happy and be unapologetic about it is probably some some good advice. You know, I stopped writing for about 10 years um, because it uh, it started to feel quite unhealthy and also it was it was very discouraged. You know, I was I it came across as quite antisocial, I think. And I think You know, there were some that were quite concerned about the fact that I spent so much time writing. And so they strongly discouraged it to the point where I felt quite guilty every time I would pick it up. Um, And it it took some time to kind of move past that. And um, absolutely, a hobby has to have boundaries, of course. You, You know, you can't you can't hold down a job and have a family and also be up all night, you know, writing. That's just not going to work. Something's going to give. So 
it has to have boundaries. But at the same time, if it's something that you really love, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. And, and you should, you should pursue that because if just for you, you know, pursue something that makes you happy and, and just for you, don't do it for someone else, I guess is probably something that has been reinforced to me by a few different people. It wasn't just one person that told me that there's been a few people in my life that kind of helped me work past that point and start writing again. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, the way you're putting it, it makes it sound like there's one person. There's actually a few for me. I'd say my my dad would be the, the first for me. Um, my dad is very creative and he's always had some really interesting hobbies. He does, he, well, I shouldn't say he doesn't write. He does write, uh, but that's not one of his, his main hobbies. Um, but my dad definitely started me on the path uh, to being a creative person and he was very encouraging and he kind of um, started me on the right road too. Like he kind of said, these are books that I really liked. Maybe you'll like them too kind of thing. So yeah, my dad would definitely be one of my earliest ones that sort of set me on my path. Um, and then I have some friends that kind of join themselves to that. And then, you know, later on my husband. So I feel like there's always been people that have sort of been almost like holding up a lantern to show me where the path is. You know, I kind of stumble along until they sort of help me out. And because I can definitely get a little bit lost and I can get very stuck in my own head. Um, so there's been people in my life that have really kept me grounded and really just helped me continue to just be me. From a professional standpoint, you've now created two books. You're working on your third. You have picked up the craft of creative writing as an author yourself after a bit of a break. You've sold books, so that means you're successful from a fresh, from a professional standpoint. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I do. I do consider myself personally successful because I'm very happy. You know, I have a lot of joy in my life. And to me, if you, if you feel happy, then it doesn't matter what else is going on in your life, whether other people are going to think that it's successful or not. It doesn't really matter because it's like, yeah, I have a lot of joy in my life and it comes from my family and my friends and my job. And then my hobby is just on top of that, you know? So yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously we always want to keep moving forward, but yeah, I would say that it is successful. It's a good question. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I usually self-medicate with ice cream, kind of something that I, that I'll do very calmly, especially when it comes to creativity is I will, I will get into like a very self-destructive phase where I'll get very down on myself. And, you know, as, as excited as I get about a success, I get equally as devastated by a failure. And so for me, just having people in my life that know me really well and kind of know how to pull me back off the edge a little bit. Um, my editor is amazing for that. He will pretty much drop whatever is going on and call and be like, okay, now step away from the delete button. Like you don't want to do this. Um, so just having people that sort of I can, I know I can talk to them and they're going to help me when I'm feeling really down or I'm feeling like a huge failure. That's been a huge support and just helping me to kind of see the humor in it as well. Like it's not the end of the world. It's just a failure. You can get past this and we'll laugh about it one day. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an author or as a creative person doing whatever they'd like to do, video, audio, etc. There's so many ways to be creative yeah. these days. It's, it's kind of mind boggling. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Hmm. I think find, find like-minded people, you know, and, and don't, don't just stick to your age group, like find, find people younger than you, older than you, you know, that have the same kind of passion and they're going to have experience so they can tell you this was a success. I tried this and it didn't work, you know, and, and just finding like-minded individuals because they can really bolster you on times that you're feeling down or you're feeling unsure. 
And also, they can just be such a wealth of information as well. So yeah, that would probably be my main advice is just surround yourself with like minded people and be a support to them as much as they are to you. I find this interesting, especially with the younger generation and social media. And this is just kind of a segue question more than anything. The amount of negativity that is being thrown around, especially on social media, especially how people in general take negative comments or take aspects where they maybe not handle negativity in the most healthiest aspect. Is there any tips you might have for those that are dealing with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. I know for me, I, I've had people say, well, you know, if you're going to put something out there, then you need to have a thick skin. And that's great. The problem for me is I actually don't have a thick skin and I'm probably never going to, you know, it's like, 10 people could give me the same insult. It's still going to hurt the 10th time. You know, I'm just not one of those individuals that it does just roll off, you know. So I think it's a really, really good point that there is negativity. Um, and not everyone out there, especially people who are creative, not everyone has that thick skin that they can just be like, well, I don't care about that. So I think in that case, um, just finding people who are going to keep you grounded. You know, you don't want someone that's just going to be like, oh, you're wonderful all the time. That's, you know, that's not practical. But just finding people that you know care about you or support you or just a genuine person and just try not to let the negativity creep into your own life and your own work because it's just not useful. And, you know, people are negative for a whole lot of reasons, but you don't need to be part of the problem and you don't need to feed that. As much positive feedback as you get, it, some people do dwell on the negative, unfortunately. It does, yeah. it does happen. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ed. Okay. Well, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Uh, again, Logan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. But before I let you go, where can we find you on social media and where can we support you or how can we support you? I should say. Yes. Well, I mean, obviously, number one, it would be great if you know, you would read my books. Uh, so they are available on Amazon. Uh, so I've got my two books. I don't know if it's mirrored or not. Let's see. Oh, Okay, so there's my book. So if you go on Amazon and go into Ebonmore, there's Offspring of the Throne, and there is also this one, my newest one that just came out, Burden of Birthright. Uh, so you can find those books on Amazon. I'm also on um, Instagram, uh, Logan Lashane underscore Ebonmore, and then also my Twitter, which I think is like at Lashane Logan. So, yeah, I think yes. those would be my, my main. Um, and I also have a website, www.loganlachane.com, and that's going to have links to all of my social media and my Amazon page. Awesome. Thank you so much again for coming in the show. Oh, thank I you. It. I really enjoyed this. And as I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Again, you can find Logan's work, of course, on Amazon, as she said. And, of course, you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com, and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And, of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and set to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey, I'm Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.